Excellent. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today um, on our second day of Legislative Conference for Rare Disease Week. Um, today, uh, we are joined by Deja Love to moderate our session. Uh, Deja Love is the CEO and founder of the Black Women's Wellness Agency, Inc., committed to the holistic wellness of Black women. Deja received her Master of Public Health from Emory University. Her 16-year career includes the federal government, local government, academia, private sector, nonprofit, and international development. Deja specializes in population health, health, health equity, and the social determinants of health. Um, we are thrilled to have Deja join us as moderator for our How Congress Can Work to Reduce Barriers to Care and Health Disparities session. Um, thank you so much for being here, Deja, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Shannon, for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, really excited to be here. It's a great topic, and I'm, I'm more so interested in how we will accomplish this in 45 minutes. It's a very vast topic, but we will do our best. Again, Deja Love here. I am representing the Black Women's um, Health Imperative that has existed for almost 40 years. It's one of the only national nonprofit organizations that is focused and committed to the holistic wellness physical, mental, financial, and health equity for the nation's 22 million Black women and girls. So very excited for this. And we have three great dynamic speakers. And so before we bring them up to the virtual stage, I really want to lay the landscape in the context for what we're discussing today, specifically about what how Congress, what Congress can do to really reduce some of the barriers in the health inequities that we're experiencing specifically with populations of color that experience rare diseases. I want to step back and first understanding that there are 30 million Americans or one in 10 that experience a rare disease. And that's a disease that it's in fact um, impacting 200,000 individuals. And Generally, for the population, it can take up to five years for there to be a diagnosis. But for patients of color, that is exacerbated. That can be substantially longer. And there are many societal factors that contribute to this. But again, in providing this context for our speakers that are in three very different positions that will bring a unique perspective, for people of color that are experiencing a rare disease, medical racism and the healthcare inequities that are experienced, that really exacerbates why there is this inequity, why populations of color take substantially longer and there are many misdiagnoses diagnoses when individuals and patients who have a rare disease. Some of those factors that contribute to that is we certainly understand that within the medical profession that specialists who are working in rare disease are geographic, geographically spread and that there are not many. And so that can really exacerbate just the confounding factors that individuals of color who are experiencing this encounter. That right now, as we know through research, that 10% of rare diseases have an FDA approved treatment and that populations of color are not are not reflected in clinical trials. And generally when we're seeing the medical racism that populations of color experience, it's really our clinicians that do not always or often invite their patients of color to a clinical trial. There's an implicit bias and notion that a patients of color, that it could be too cumbersome of an experience that it could just, that they may not understand. And so that really exacerbates this experience Experience. And so just with providing this landscape as well, that people of color represent 30, 38% of the U.S. population, yet in clinical trials are only 16%. And so that's showing that there's a vast inequity. And so I wanted to just hold that. I, I will pause here. And as we invite our first speaker, Lauren, who's a legislative director, 
with Representative Rush, I, I welcome hearing your perspective, specifically as Representative Rush is very active with the Congressional Black Caucus that is positioned to address some of these disparities. I invite you and welcome to hear your perspective as followed by Shane as well as uh, Dr. Kim. Lauren, your uh, audio isn't working for some reason. Sorry to interrupt. It, it might be your earbuds. Test, test, test. Does that work? Yes, that does. That seems like Go that's ahead. better. The wrong microphone. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so thank you again so much for having me here today. Um, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, I've been asked to talk about how Congressman Rush's passion for equity and rare diseases, the work he's done on these fronts, um, along with the work being done by the Congressional Black Caucus um, more broadly and kind of give his personal perspective um, and how I view it as, as a legislative a director and a health staffer. Um, and honestly, it's been an honor to work for Congressman Rush, who represents Chicago, Illinois. Um, he's a champion for the underdog, and he's been so for his entire professional career. He often reminisces about starting a, a free medical clinic back in his early 20s, um, where volunteers would canvas the neighborhoods of the south and west side of Chicago, going um, from door to door to bring health care directly to, to the communities that need them the most. They provided screenings for high blood pressure, lead poisoning, tuberculosis, diabetes, and sickle cell anemia, among other care, um, which is such a tremendous start to his career. Um, and then on a personal front, years later, Congressman Rush was diagnosed with salivary gland cancer. It really came out of nowhere for him. He had no family history um, or other signs that he was predisposed to this potentially fatal disease. But um, thank goodness for the fantastic medical care he got at the University of Chicago, which is in his district, um, and he is alive and well today. Um, and I always say that while he always clearly was committed to access to healthcare, um, this experience really had him double down on it and, and uh, made him even more passionate to ensuring that everyone had access to and could afford the screenings, treatments, medicine, and care that they need. Um, and it's really honestly personal for him. He's alive today because he could access this care. And he likes to say that he shouldn't be special or an anomaly. Uh, everyone should be able to do the same. And so he really fights for that. And while he firmly believes that this care should be available for everyone, it's the black and brown communities that are most likely to be left behind, whose health concerns are too often minimized, and who, because of bias, whether from algorithms or from implicit or explicit provide, uh, bias from providers or even kind of institutions at large, um, they are often diagnosed with diseases too late to be successfully treated. And the congressman always likes to quote the age old saying, when, when white America catches a cold, black America catches pneumonia. And I think that's really, really true. Um, the need for equity and to fight racial disparities is just as, cl as clear for rare diseases as it is for the more common ones like cancer, for sickle cell as it is for diabetes, for kidney disease, and for COVID. And the list just goes on and on and on on where we have room to grow. Um, and so as the Congressman's health staffer and as for you all as advocates coming to the Hill, I think it's really important that we think creative, creatively about all the ways barriers can be lowered to increase access to care. Um, and so I wanted to go over some of the ways that the Congressman and the Congressional Black Caucus like to think about addressing equity. Um, I think the first one's kind of the most obvious. There's the affordability of care. So we work on this aspect a lot, a lot and it's so vital. Um, for example, we think a lot about screenings and making sure that the cost is not a barrier to diagnosing diseases, um, which is, all, as, as we already heard, such a problem with rare diseases. Um, an example in the prostate cancer world is my boss's PSA screening for HIM Act, which weighs all cost pay, all co-pays, deductibles, and other cost sharing for those at risk of developing prostate cancer, and specifically for African Americans and those with a first degree family history of metastatic cancer who are most at risk. Um, another big issue is affordability medication. Um, my, my office has a bill, the Insulin Access for All Act, which has the support of most of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, it would ensure insulin is free of charge for Medicare and Medicaid patients. And then more generally, the House has passed a bill called the Elijah E. Cummings Lower Drug Costs Now Act that would allow for the first time Medicare to negotiate drug costs as well as cap out-of-pocket costs for seniors. Um, and as you may already know, it was named after the renowned Elijah Cummings, who was a fighter on this issue in Congress for many, many years. 
And then one last one on the technical side, the Congressman has a, introduced a bill the Protecting Consumer Access to Generic Drugs Act that would stop um, pay for delay agreements where brand companies literally pay generics not to bring their drugs to market. And this is an issue that we've seen a lot of progress on that the Congressman has been working on for a long time, but there's still a lot of room to grow um, to make sure that people don't have to choose between putting food on the table and paying for life-saving medications. So that's the first bucket. Uh, the second one is access to care, um, which can include uh, a lot of things, but uh, particularly the way we view it is uh, making sure that we pay providers enough that they can afford to offer services or even continue to operate. Most recently, my office has worked in a bipartisan manner to ensure that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services doesn't implement uh, massive cuts to office-based providers. Um, if these uh, cuts were imp fully implemented, doctor's offices and clinics would close which would severely limit care for Medicare patients and frankly would often be on the backs of doctors who treat that diseases that disproportionately impact minorities. Um, so we've been fighting hard against that. Uh, the Congressman and his colleagues have also introduced a bill ensuring adequate reimbursement for diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals that more accurately diagnose rare diseases like Alzheimer's disease, brain disorders, epilepsy, heart and kidney disorders, and many, many more. Um, the Congressman is very concerned that if hospitals lose money every time they offer innovative treatments and, and diagnostics and, and tests, uh, it will lead to a two-tiered health system where the wealthy can afford the best diagnostics and treatments anytime they want, and everyone else just has to make do with what they can get when they can get it, uh, and it'll just make the problem worse and worse and worse. Um, so he thinks that's wrong, and we need to fight that, um, which is why we've been working on, on legislation to do so. So that's the second bucket. Uh, the third one is ensuring that access that uh, patients have access to providers that look like them and who are from their communities. Um, on this front, the Congressman has the Allied Health Workforce Diversity Act, which passed the House last Congress and we're hopeful it'll pass again this year. Uh, the legislation gives funding to universities to attract, retain, and graduate diverse and underrepresented providers um, in occupations that tend to be overwhelmingly white. We know that when doctors look like their patients, patients have better health outcomes. And I've always viewed this bill as like a template or a pilot program to kind of to expand it from the, the professions in the bill to other professions and other specialties. Um, so we were able to make this bipartisan by pairing the incentives to recruit racial and ethnic disparities with those from rural areas, which is a strategy I think is often used um, to bring together um, you know, Democrats and Republicans across the aisle in legislation. And then one other bill on this front is my boss has the Communities Act to provide full student loan relief to those who um, are committed to serving in medically underserved areas for a period of five years. Um, this incentive will make them um, this longer commitment makes it more likely uh, providers will stay in these areas and the fin financial relief will make it so, so that they're able to do so financially. Um, and then two last buckets, uh, there's ensuring that treatments actually work on black and brown bodies through diverse clinical trials. It's something that my office has worked on a lot, that the Congressional Black Caucus has worked on a lot, and which I believe Shane is gonna speak on more. So I'll leave that to, to him to cover. Um, and then there's the um, social determinants of health. So ensuring that every part of a person's life is contributing positively to their health it includes housing, access to healthy foods, transportation, and so much more. And it's something that the Commercial Black Caucus has been thinking on really critically and working on pretty substantially. Um, and then just finally, I think it's important to note that the Commercial Black Caucus um, works, the members in the Commercial Black Caucus work really closely together. They share ideas weekly, um, both on the staff level and on the member level, and really partner to pass legislation and try to lift up one another's ideas. Uh, it's a powerful caucus that really is able to get things done, especially when it pairs with Caucus is like the uh, GOP Doctors Caucus, and in conjunction with groups like the Tri Caucus, which also has the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus in it. Um, and historically, the CBC has had just such a strong focus on health equity, and a lot of really good ideas come from its members. And they have the political capital to get things done, which we saw um, when the House was struggling to pass the bill back better. The CBC came together and put pressure on leadership to move the bill. Um, so there's a lot of potential this Congress to make a big difference in, in a bipartisan way for rare disease issues and health issues. And I'm so excited to see what we can work on together. And thank you again so much for having me um, and looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Lauren, appreciate that. Such great, uh, great insight, great feedback. I do wanna transition now to Shane to bring you to the virtual stage and hearing about your work specifically with Senator Scott. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Deja, and uh, thank you so much to RDLA and all of our rare advocates and stakeholders that are joining us here today. My name is Shane Woods, and I handle healthcare policy uh, for Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. Uh, 
I want to start first uh, before diving into the Diverse Trials Act. I, I first want to back up just a, a, a few years to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, which really marked a turning point in the world of healthcare, uh, you know, for, for obvious reasons, but also uh, with regard to innovation. What I mean by that is that the pandemic really initiated this rapid shift of resources and services to help maintain control of the virus. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, by the way, let's go ahead and uh, go to the next slide there. Ah, perfect, excellent, excellent. I think we all are familiar with this image by now. We've certainly been living with it for long enough. Um, but, but going back to what I was saying, you know, this, the pandemic really initiated this rapid shift of resources, services uh, to help maintain and, and control the virus. Uh, in addition uh, to the innovation accelerating uh, the pace of change, across the healthcare sector. Uh, but at the same time too, it also laid bare uh, the various historic disparities uh, impacting patients, but not only laid that bare, but exacerbated those historic disparities uh, that impact patients across our healthcare system, uh, including upstream in clinical trials. And, and just to give you guys an example of that, uh, according to the FDA's uh, Drug Trial Snapshot Summary Report, of the 53 novel therapeutics FDA approved in 2020, 75% of the 32,000 patients enrolled or participating in these clinical trials were white, with only 8% of folks uh, taking part in that research being Black or African American, uh, which is, of course, below the national average. Uh, you know, and in, in, in Deja uh, alluded to this earlier, she mentioned this earlier, some of the barriers to trial participation uh, from underrepresented groups. And, and some of those barriers can include uh, income disparities, right? You know, which can prevent people from enrolling in trials where there might be out-of-pocket expenses, out-of-pocket costs associated with participating in that trial or not covered by the research team. Uh, geographical limitations, of course. Uh, trials, you know, just aren't uh, often conducted in locations with diverse patient populations and participants may be unable um, or you know, perhaps unwilling to travel long distances uh, to reach clinic, uh, uh, clinical trial sites. And then of course, a lack of awareness and, and trust. Uh, you know, the engagement of researchers and trial sponsors with minority groups uh, is often inadequate. You know, just, just you know, being honest here, being, being blunt, it's, it's often inadequate. Uh, and there remains a lack of trust uh, between these communities in the research field. Uh, and it's largely driven by the, the long history of scientific inclusion. So it's kind of this, you know, uh, uh, you know sort of circle here um, with, with regard to, uh, with regard to uh, the, the lack of awareness of trust. Uh, next slide, please. All right, excellent. So what? The big question, right? So what? Okay, that uh, you know that that's certainly concerning, Shane. But but so what? You know why is diversity in clinical trials so so important? Okay, well let's let's dive into this this question for a moment. Okay, diversity in clinical trials is critical uh, critical to ensuring that a drug is safe and efficacious for all patients to whom it is administered. You know, and, and, and many variables can uh, impact how a patient will respond to a treatment, including intrinsic factors such as genetics, ancestry, or extrinsic factors. Uh, you know, some of those things could be diet, uh, the environment, uh, you know, someone's in, uh, socio-cultural uh, issues, things like that. And so collecting data on a wide variety of patients uh, and performing really in-depth analyses can, can help identify population-specific signals related to uh, drug metabolism, safety, uh, or even efficacy of the treatment and provide uh, ultimately insight into the optimal therapeutic approach for different populations. Next slide. All right, that brings us to, drum roll please, the Diverse Trials Act. So, okay, how do we, you know, multi-million dollar question, right? How, how do we actually increase 
clinical trial diversity, where rubber meets the road, what does that look like? Uh, so we have a bipartisan piece of legislation. The senator uh, teamed up with uh, Senator uh, Bob Menendez from New Jersey, of course, uh, you know, a state that is no stranger to drug development, drug manufacturing, a lot of, a lot of presence of uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies out in, uh, out in New Jersey and up that way. Um, we were also joined by our House colleagues, uh, Representatives Bouchon and, and Ruiz, uh, some great doctors in energy and commerce, uh, to introduce the Diversifying Investigations by Equitable Research Studies for Everyone Trials Act, or you know, just to, to, to be more short, uh, the Diverse Trials Act. And under the bill, uh, we, we actually do a targeted approach to increasing the diversity of clinical trial participants, specifically by A, requiring the Department of Health and Human Services to issue guidance on decentralized clinical trials, which so, so very important, uh, especially when you're talking about uh, eliminating some of these geographical disparities, uh, 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 removing some of the barriers for folks to be able to uh, participate in these trials, and also open yourself up to a wider uh, a swath of, uh, of, of potential trial participants as well. Uh, two, enabling clinical trial sponsors to provide individuals, patients, you know, with the technology necessary for them to participate remotely in these trials. So again, taking one of those uh, barriers, you know, uh, be it the financial barrier or, or what have you, out of the equation. And of course, we go even further by permitting patients to receive financial support uh, for non-medical costs associated with their participation in a clinical trial. Again, addressing one of those uh, uh, key issues there with regard to uh, financial barriers uh, to participation. So as breakthroughs in genetics, immunotherapy, systems biology, precision medicine. I mean, this is all stuff that I remember growing up uh, watching Star Trek, uh, you know, that this, this, was, this, this was serious sci-fi stuff, but we're seeing it now. We're even being able to, 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 to see not only just the T word therapies, but even the C word in some cases, cures to some of this stuff. And we, won't, we don't want anyone left behind out of the promise of that. And so, uh, uh, you know, as these things are coming online here, the speed of innovation, um, you know, in, in other specialties lead to more effective treatments. And, and as I, you know, alluded to potential cures for many, you know, uh, of, of the most challenging disease states, including rare diseases, making clinical trials more efficient, inclusive, and accessible, as the Diverse Trials Act uh, would do means bringing, again, these life-saving innovations to all Americans, which is so vitally important. Last slide. All right. So uh, you guys have been great. I, I really appreciate it. I just want to end on, um, on, on this final thought, leave you with this. You know, as breakthroughs, you know, in genetics, again, immunotherapy, all these things, you know, are, are happening. You know, we need to ensure, again, that we're doing our darndest to make sure we're not leaving any patient behind. And that's why, again, it's so critically important uh, that we have that diversity uh, represented in our clinical trials. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Shane. Thank you so much for your feedback on and just your insight on the Diverse Trials Act. I'm sure in the Q&A, we're going to dive much deeper into that. So thank you for that. And our last speaker, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much, Deja. I'm very happy to be here today. I am Daisy Kim, Policy Manager for the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank the Every Life Foundation for inviting me to this panel. Um, today, I will be speaking about the Health Equity and Accountability Act, which is also known as HIA. Um, introduced in every Congress since 2003, HIA is sponsored by the tri caucuses consisting of the Congressional Black, Hispanic, and Asian and Pacific American caucuses. So every year, the responsibility for revising and introducing the bill is rotated among the three caucuses, 
And this year, the bill is hosted by the Congressional Black Caucus. Now, HIA is a comprehensive bill that aims to eliminate racial and ethnic health disparities by removing barriers to accessing information, health services, and health education. It seeks to reform our health system to ensure that historically marginalized communities and communities who face health disparities receive the health services they need to thrive. Specifically, HIA expands federal health care resources for racial and ethnic minorities, as well as other underserved populations who face discrimination and barriers to care, including immigrants and rural communities. Um, it also increases federal resources to address diseases that disproportionately impact minority communities, such as cancer, hepatitis, bone marrow, sickle cell, diabetes, uh, as well as cardiovascular disease. Second, HIA addresses social determinants of health um, to mitigate the effects of systemic poverty and discrimination. And finally, HIA reduces racial health disparities by dismantling barriers and funding programs to support mental, infant, maternal, sexual, and reproductive health for marginalized and underserved communities. So in this presentation, I will not be able to go over each and every one of the provisions of HIA, which currently is a massive bill that stands at over a thousand pages, but I will highlight two important areas by which HIA seeks to reduce health disparities. The first one is on data collection. A major provision in HIA is to promote data collection, analysis, and reporting by race, ethnicity, sex, primary language, among others, in federally funded health programs. As we saw in this pandemic, we continue to lack comprehensive data to fully understand racial disparities in health and healthcare. Data are essential for identifying where the disparities exist and for creating policies, directing efforts and resources where they are needed the most. So without adequate data, in inequities remain unseen and unaddressed. This provision in HIA is based on the understanding that the health needs and disparity gaps cannot truly be known or addressed without more equitable data. So to give you an example of the importance of detailed data, um, health data on the Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community is often not collected, or if it is, it is aggregated into one large single category encompassing all subgroups. However, there are over 25 million AA and NHPI people who originate from over 50 different countries of origin and who speak over 100 different languages, meaning that the aggregated data cannot reveal the variation and range in health disparities that may exist by subgroup populations. In the rare disease community, both limited data and lack of standardized detailed data have impeded the ability of researchers to identify and quantify rare disease patients. Further, insufficient race and ethnicity data mean patients of color who are also rare disease patients have been chronically underrepresented, including in population genetic studies, as well as clinical trials. Without representative data that reflects the most uh, excuse me, without representative data that reflects the patient population accurately and completely, our knowledge of how rare diseases impact certain communities remains limited and identifying the gaps in care remain a challenge. So HIA aims to address disparities in access to care, as well as in health outcomes by improving and strengthening the collection, analysis, and reporting of data in federally funded programs. The second provision that I'd like to turn to in HIA is culturally and linguistically appropriate care. We all know that effective communication is essential to meaningful access to quality health care. For example, the difficulty of communicating with the provider can make it difficult or serve as a deterrent for patients trying to seek and receive care. The lack of appropriate language services can also create language barriers that result in misdiagnoses as well as ineffective treatment plans. Now, limited English proficiency has been associated with poor health outcomes. According to the US Census, limited English proficient persons are, for, are those for whom English is not their primary language. Now, more than 25 million or approximately 9% of the US population is considered limited English proficient. Within the Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community, uh, limited English proficient peoples 
compromise, comp comprise a larger percentage of the population with approximately one in three Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders being limited English proficient. For rare disease patients who are also limited English proficient, culturally and linguistically appropriate care is that much more critical to reducing barriers to care. Now, to promote culturally and linguistically appropriate care, HIA outlines concrete steps for improving language access services. And these include increased funding for language services through um, interpreters, as well as translated materials, providing cultural competency training to healthcare providers, and steps to ensure diversity in the clinical workforce. So these examples give just a taste of how HIA is a bold blueprint for tackling immense inequities in our healthcare system and reducing barriers to care. It remains the signature legislation in Congress to advance health equity writ large. I would also like to point out that many of its provisions have inspired or have been incorporated into other health equity legislation. So how can rare disease advocates get involved with HIA? Um, over the years, over 300 advocacy groups have participated in the HIA Community Working Group, which works with congressional staff to review and provide updates to the bill every year. Each year, there is a designated lead organization that coordinates the stakeholder edits from the Community Working Group. This year, the Community Working Group has been led by the National Urban League, which has been coordinating with the Tri-Caucus staff and working towards getting the bill introduced to Congress um, by this April. While the community working group is almost done with submitting the title edits for this year, there will be more opportunities in the future to participate and engage other health advocacy groups in discussions around edits to HIA. Next year, the Congressional Asian and Pacific American Caucus, KPAC, will host the introduction of HIA to the 118th Congress. So I'd encourage interested groups and advocates to stay tuned for communications about how to participate in the HIA Community Working Group. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, just great remarks. I think in our remaining about 10 minutes, we do want to get into a Q&A. We may not be able to get to all questions, but I really, I want to start first with Lauren as you started our presentation. So given that we know with the data that 80% of participants who are participating in clinical trials, that they report that their ancestry is European. And so clearly that's a huge inequity. And so I'm really curious what I've seen a little bit just gleaning from some in the chat is from your position as legislative director, how do you feel that Congress can really heed the voice of populations that are not represented? 80% are coming from European descent. That excludes a vast portion of the population. And I think there's this anecdotal sentiment that the current Congress, that it is just, it's not as in tune or sensitive to the voices of those that are not represented. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. That's right. Um, I think there's legislation that is working to address that, and the goal will be to add more co-sponsors and, and kind of keep the momentum moving on that. I think where we have also really found success is as a congressional office, we have worked with the hospitals in our district and in the surrounding areas in Chicago, University of Chicago and Northwestern, to set up programs at those universities that uh, to help kind of waive some of the barriers to get the diverse clinical trials so that to get more diversity into the trials happening there. Um, so I think things are hard at the federal level. They move slow, they're frustrating, um, but there's always a chance to kind of go local and to work with uh, folks on the ground to, to make an immediate impact as we continue to push kind of the, the longer term policy goals, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think it's it's a segue into Shane, I want to bring you in on this, um, given what you presented with the Diverse Trials Act, and knowing that we are still in an active pandemic, and that there have been, especially at the onset, maybe in 2020, where advocates and a lot of folks in academia were constantly saying we need data distilled by different ethnic groups. I would love to hear your thoughts on what do you think that we're learning from this pandemic as it can be applied to a diversity of representation in clinical trials? Sure, you know, it's not so much, I think, you know, anything new that we're learning so much as it's 
uh, getting more exposure uh, to a broader swath of, of the population that's really going, okay, we've got a problem here. We've got to sound the alarm on that. Um, I, because, you know, we, we, we have, uh, you know, known for, for years uh, that we don't have adequate representation. I mean, this is something, you know, uh, that, that I've been engaged in, you know, as a staffer, you know, even in my time uh, over in the House of Representatives, uh, you know, where, um, you know, just, uh, just, just last Congress, I believe it was, uh, we were finally able to, uh, you know, my previous office working with uh, Congressman Bill Arrakis, uh, were able to partner, I think it was with uh, Dr. Ruiz, in fact, uh, be able to partner and um, uh, uh, be able to graft in uh, Medicaid uh, enrollees into being able to, to receive reimbursement for participation in clinical trials. We obviously know the, the very diverse, uh, you know, diversely rich population that, uh, you know, is, is represented in Medicaid, uh, not only from health states, but also uh, in terms of uh, a, a regional or uh, ethnic or racial diversity as well. Um, and, but yet they were, they were kept on the periphery. They were kept on the outside looking in while everyone else, you know, whether you're talking private health insurers, whether you're talking private health insurance, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, even VA coverage, uh, uh, Medicare coverage, um, TRICARE, all of these uh, uh, folks were reimbursing for uh, the routine cost of, associate, uh, of participation in a clinical trial. Um, and so that was one of those uh, uh, issues, even way back when, uh, again, that we were uh, working on, uh, and finally, just recently, you know, ahead of the pandemic, thank goodness, uh, we're able to, to see, see it through. But again, I think that the uh, pandemic really, it wasn't anything uh, sort of new per se that, that, we've, that we've learned so much as, uh, you know, with the exacerbation of, you know, the pandemic on a lot of things, uh, you know, uh, uh, impacts to people being able to access clinical trial sites and, and what have you. There were, uh, and a lot of questions that folks were asking, um, you know, that, this was one of those that was that, you know, blinking light on the dashboard that more folks just became aware of. And just as a really quick example, if, it, if it's okay. Um, I keep thinking back to the beginning of the pandemic when it was going around on Twitter that African-Americans couldn't get COVID. And that was because it started in China where there were very few African-Americans and how dangerous that was to use kind of such a small sample size where everyone's not being included um, to, and then extrapolating to um, the general population and the American population in a way that affects people's actions and put people at risk. And so obviously that was for the disease itself and not the treatments, but it kind of is like a spotlight on how dangerous it is to go with just European descent or just Asian descent for, and then making broad generalizations from that. Oh, definitely. Thank you, Lauren, for that, adding that. Such a great point. I think, Shane, I'm looking in the, the chat, and there's a question to your point that you mentioned is a participant asking about the Diverse Trials Act, if there's an age limit. Can you speak to that? So it, in, the, uh, in, in, in the bill, we do not put an age limit on, uh, on participation. Um, you know, obviously, age can be another uh, factor with regard to uh, diversity of, uh, of, of participation. So that was something we did not uh, specify with regard to uh, age, uh, you know, age limits uh, with regard to participation. Okay, thank you, Shane. And Dr. Kim, I want to bring you in here a question that just came in to the chat. I think that has implications for the legislation you talked about. Um, Joyce is asking what happens to multicultural individuals and those that are not recognized in a certain race due to unjust blood percentage rules, multicultural Hawaiians, indigenous and others. Um, thank you for that question. I, I think it's an excellent question that perhaps HIA has not 
considered enough of, and it, it could be an opportunity for folks interested on the issue to really advocate and include language in HIA that would include that information. One thing I could say as, as a community working group member, I mean, those are the kinds of conversations that we have as stakeholders, as advocates saying, well, what about, you know, what about multicultural individuals? What about individuals who don't identify um, in a particular way in, in, in the race and ethnicity categories that are designated by the federal government. Um, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done um, in the sense that, you know, he has been around for a long time and it's ever evolving. It's also a very organic piece of legislation. Um, and I think that's why the participation in the community working group is that much more important to ensure that the legislation is up to date when it does get introduced to Congress. So um, thank you for that question. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. And just another question here that we see someone asks, what percent of the population is of non-European descent? The participant is asking because they, they are of mixed ethnicity. And so I you know, pose that to all of our speakers, but we do know from the Black Women's Health Imperative, the data that we have is that 38% of the population is non-European. Um, and I'm looking at time, I know we have about four minutes remaining. There was another question in the chat, a little bit longer that I wanted to get to and, and really invite all of our speakers, Lauren, um, Dr. Kim Shane, to address to an extent. I'll try to surmise it, but it's really looking at there's um, the Lymphedemia Treatment Act is before Congress, but they will not allow it to be passed as a standalone bill and have had no success in getting it added to a larger bill. Just this act would allow patients that need medic medical necess necessary compression garments that are not covered by their insurance or Medicare to be covered. Many patients can't afford to pay out of pocket and must go without these items and many end up in the hospital. It's important that Congress understand that this the, the need for compression garments to be covered. And I, I welcome, Lauren, you starting because you alluded to that a little bit in, in, in your remarks that you said the process is long and it's not always as linear as I think we would want it to be, but could you touch on this, this loaded, very timely question? Sure, yeah, there are so many good ideas and so little time to get everything through. Um, floor time is incredibly limited um, on the House side, and I think Shane would say it's even more limited on the Senate side. Um, so it's very tough. Um, I think kind of the perspective that my boss has is you try as much as possible. Um, I know Jan Schakowsky is the sponsor of this, and she is a fighter. And whenever I go to my boss and I say, do you want to do a letter or do you want to uh, do a bill or do you want, like, how do you want to get this? He goes, why are you asking either or? Do both and. Like, the, the squeaky wheel really does get the grease. And so kind of just taking advantage of every opportunity that comes up to, um, to, to, to write to leadership or to do a coalition letter or to have Jan Schakowsky lead a uh, congressional sign-on letter to ask for its inclusion or ask to have leadership take it up or, you know, you just kind of want to consider all options because I think the problem isn't finding good bills, it's finding the bandwidth and time to get them passed. Uh, and it's something we struggle with, I think, every day. Um, with, for our bills and for the bills my boss is a co-sponsor of, it's just trying to figure out ways to, to get them to move. Um, and I think you just, the squeaky wheel gets the grease and you just keep trying. Thank you, Lauren. I know Dr. Kim and Shane, we just have a couple of minutes, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that as we round out this session. Sure. Well, you know, I won't, uh, you know, be try not to beat a dead horse here. Um, you know, I think Lauren's point is uh, spot on. Uh, just with regard uh, to sometimes just congressional bandwidth. However, uh, this is one of those bills that I can say uh, does certainly does not suffer from lack of uh, member education. I think the advocates have done a fa fabulous job over multiple Congresses uh, to, uh, to visit offices, engage offices, round up co-sponsors, and uh, uh, really, again, help uh, educate members on the plight of patients, uh, lymphedema patients, um, with, re with regard to uh, their need to uh, get these uh, 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 compression garments and the like uh, as a, uh, you know, preventative uh, measure instead of, uh, you know, kind of putting themselves, uh, you know, in, in our healthcare system, uh, you know, at uh, financial risk and, and for patients uh, at medical risk. 
Uh, I think, you know, as far as, you know, what, what can be done to help advance the ball uh, with, with regard to this piece of legislation, that just honestly comes, uh, you know, from conversations with, uh, you know, uh, the committee chairs, ranking members, uh, members on the committee, uh, just continuing to uh, press the case, uh, figuring out, okay, you know, where is trying to get a sense of where's the committee going to go? How uh, can we uh, take what we're working on and marry that up to, uh, you know, where the committee is, is looking to, uh, you know, looking to go uh, during a particular session uh, and, and seeing, uh, you know, if, if there's some way to, uh, you know, create some symbiosis there. Um, I'd just like to add that, um, just kind of piggybacking off of what Lauren and uh, Shane have, have remarked upon, I think two things. Um, I think working in coalition with other advocacy groups is very important, engaging in those discussions and sharing ideas, brainstorming, um, coming up with strategies and in ways to approach uh, solutions. And then second, um, continuing to engage congressional staffers. I mean, you know, they're very, very busy folks, but, you know, it, 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 you know they're often willing to listen, right? And so I think with too, which has been largely an aspirational bill, right? The fact that, you know, community engagement has been very strong um, and advocacy groups have continued to remain engaged means that we continue to push for health equity. And that's really the only way to achieve um, something that monumental. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thank you, Lauren and Shane. Really appreciate your insight, your expertise and perspectives. This is, the, the chat is everyone's really enjoying this panel. Um, thank you all for being here. I know we have remarks from Shannon, so I will end here. Thank you, Deja, and thank you to Shane, Daisy, and Lauren for being here today. Um, I agree, this was really informative. You guys did an excellent job breaking it all down for advocates. I do have just a couple of announcements. Next slide, Caitlin. So next um, today, we're going to finish out the day with our networking happy hour at 4 p.m. So after this session, you can click back over to the platform and join one of four networking sessions. Um, the first is starting your advocacy journey as a new rare disease advocate. We also have a networking session on state advocacy and another on how to engage with state drug utilization reviews and pharmacy and therapeutics committees. And then another on newborn screening rust alignment. So you just have to click back to um, the platform to 4 p.m. and click on one of the sessions that you would like to join. And then for our young adults, we have a meetup at 5 p.m. Um, and that is for our young adults between the ages of 16 to 30. Um, they'll be meeting up and uh, discussing the week's events and networking with one another. And then our upcoming events, if you have any questions about what has happened already this week or about your Hill meetings for next week, you can join Caitlin and I and uh, Sarah and Sarita and, and perhaps a few others for an office hour tomorrow at noon uh, Eastern time. Um, and don't forget, Rare Disease Day at NIH is on Monday and the Hill meetings with our representatives are taking place on Tuesday and meetings with senators on Wednesday of next week. And then um, FDA is holding um, an FDA Rare Disease Day on Friday as well. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope to see all of you at a networking session in just a few minutes. Thank you everyone. And thank you to our speakers and our moderator. Have a great day.